medical evaluation of medical device from another perspective. Today, we'll start with the MDR and the general safety and performance requirements, very, very short. And we'll see how the ISO 1093 series fits uh, to the purpose. After that, uh, we'll see the ISO 1093-1 of 2018 and the main changes uh, in our approach to the biological evaluation. As you know, uh, the most relevant change is associated uh, with the request of the chemical and physical information as a prerequisite of the biological evaluation. Therefore, we'll see something of the brand new ISO 1083-18 of 2020. And finally, uh, something, let me say just a flavor, uh, of the toxicological risk assessment. So the ISO 1083-17. I have omitted the year in ISO 1083-17 because the standard is under a deep revision, really a, a huge revision, and the current edition is, uh, is giving way. So let's start with the MDR, and uh, for sure you are familiar with the Annex 1, where the general safety and performance requirements are, uh, are listed. Those requirements are general. As you know, we are in the so-called new approach. And of course, uh, they do not provide technicalities on how to comply with, uh, with them. Anyway, it's uh, there, it's here that we find the need to assess the biocompatibility when they need to perform a biological evaluation of our device. Uh, MDR says that particular attention shall be paid to the choice of materials and substances used in a medical device, particularly as regard toxicity. The compatibility between the materials and the substances and the biological tissue, cells, body fluids, take into account the intended purpose of the device and where relevant absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And of of course, uh, the MDR says to take into account the impact of the process on material properties. We will account for all those things during the biological evaluation of our device. So when we are dealing with the biocompatibility, we need a well-defined approach, providing a scientific and a robust proof. This approach should save time and cost, and of course, maybe the most important, accepted by notified body and by the competent authorities in general. To perform an assessment of the safety, perform an assessment of the biocompatibility of a medical device, we rely on the ISO 1093 series. The series is developed by ISO TC194 and in Europe by SAN TC206. Uh, we have now 17 working group at ISO level and one subcommittee working on, uh, on those standards, so working on the, on, the, on the entire series. And so far, more than 30 documents were issued by this uh, TC. So we have a lot of documents uh, available for the biological uh, evaluation. Uh, by the way, ISO TC194 is also taking care about the clinical, uh, the clinical evaluation with a, with a specific standard. At the moment, as you know, no standard is harmonized under MDR. And of course, ISO 1093 series is not harmonized uh, at all. We have to wait a little bit to have harmonized uh, standard uh, under MDR. The ISO 1093 series is the most important series for the biological evaluation. And when we start uh, the biological evaluation, we start from the beginning. So we start from part one. ISO 1093-1 of 2018 is the first part, both in publication and in reading order for a complete evaluation. A little bit of history of this, uh, of this standard. ISO and FDA played a sort of ping pong in the biocompatibility field. In 1987, FDA issued the tripartite guidance tripartite biocompatibility guidance G87-1, including the so-called several general principles ruling the biological, uh, the biological evaluation. Those principles are still valid. Let me say that ISO replied in 1992 with ISO 1083-1, guidance on selection of tests. 
1995, FDA issued the guidance on the use of the ISO 1093-1, the famous Bluc Memorandum G95. In 1997, ISO issued a new version of the part one with a new title, Evaluation and Testing. Uh, the standard was then updated in uh, 2003 and in 2009, but with a brand new title, Evaluation and Testing Within Risk Management Process. This was a huge change uh, in our approach from a checklist, uh, selection of the test, to risk assessment. But let me say that the checklist approach is hard to, to, to die. FDA waited a, a little bit, and in 2017 uh, and 16, sorry, um, issued a guidance to the uh, 2009 edition. ISO replied, let me say, in 2018 with a new standard, so the ISO 23-1 of 2018, and uh, finally, FDA updated its guidance. Uh, September of um, 2020, but still referring to the ISO standard of 2009. So we have a new guidance uh, from, from FDA referring to the old version of ISO 1083-1. But today we are just focused at ISO, ISO level. Maybe the FDA approach is for the next uh, webinar. The ISO uh, approach, as we have seen, uh, as we have seen, is evolving from the first edition of 1992 guidance on selection of tests to the fifth edition, uh, the, the current one, evaluation and testing within a risk management process. The ISO 1093-1 specify the general principle governing the biological evaluation of medical device within a risk management process. The general categorization of medical device based on the nature and duration of, uh, of the contact with, uh, with the body, the evaluation and, and, um, of the existing uh, relevant data from all sources, we we'll see this uh, later on, the identification of gaps in the available data set on the basis of the risk analysis, the identification of additional data set necessary to analyze the biological safety of the device, and finally, the assessment of the biological safety of the medical device. So the assessment of the biocompatibility of, uh, of the medical device. I have already said a lot of times uh, biological evaluation, but and uh, some other times biocompatibility. So let's see the definition from part one of the biocompatibility. Biocompatibility is the ability of a medical device or material to perform with an appropriate host uh, response in a specific application. These properties, this ability, is assessed by performing biological tests and or uh, evaluating the effects of leachable chemicals. The biocompatibility, the, this kind of assessment, those uh, properties are linked for sure with the morphological properties of a medical uh, device. And last but not least, maybe the most relevant part, those are linked with the performance of the medical device. So when we are dealing with the biocompatibility, we have to think uh, in a, let me say, holistic way. So we have to uh, related to, uh, to, the medical, uh, to the medical device. The biological evaluation is a design verification activity, which is set in a, let me say, context of the broader risk management uh, process. And this is uh, a, a flow chart related, a general flow chart related to the risk management that is included in ISO 1083-1. So the consideration of the biological risk is only one aspect of the risk assessment of the medical device, which should consider all uh, aspects of, uh, of risk. So the biological risk is a small, maybe not so small part of the overall uh, risk management of, this medic of the medical device. And the flow chart is, a, a, as I said, the, the generic one related to the, risk, uh, to the risk management. But I'd like to share with you the same flow chart uh, from the ISO 14971 of 2019 when there is a clear indication 
of a plan. So for the biocompatibility assessment, generally speaking, for the risk management, but specifically, uh, today we are dealing with the biological, biological evaluation. So the biological evaluation, the biocompatibility assessment, we have to plan it. We call this document, um, as you can easily imagine, biological evaluation plan. It is really the key document of, uh, uh, of our assessment. If we see this flowchart from another perspective, we, uh, I, I put here this, that is uh, uh, more or less the same flowchart, but more specifically for the biological evaluation. This is from ISO 18562-1, so uh, the, the standard, or let me say the, the series, dealing with the biocompatibility of a briefing gas pathway. But this flowchart can be used also for, for other products because it's a quite generic flowchart for the, uh, the biological uh, uh, evaluation. As you, as you see here, I hope that you are able uh, to see uh, my arrow. The first step the, is the hazard identification. So we start from, from there. Just We have to, to wait just one slide to, to start with hazard identification. And because we have to pay attention before the hazard uh, identification to, some, uh, to something, we need to keep in mind during the entire process the intended use of, uh, of the device mainly in terms of duration and localization of uh, contact. It's all also worth to consult regulatory guidance other than the ISO 1083 series. Maybe there is a nice guidance uh, from, uh, from FDA for that specific device that help us uh, in, uh, in the development of our, uh, of our plan. So we have to take into account guidance. We have to take into account specific product standards, so vertical product standard dealing with the biocompatibility of, um, of the device. So guiding really the, our, our assessment. Moreover, we have to take into account some, uh, some special uh, factors because uh, during the during the evaluation, maybe that we have also to, to think about this. For example, a contact with uh, uh, the device is intended to be in contact with tooth, but later on it's uh, going to be in contact with the uh, with the mucosal uh, mucosal membrane, and we have information just for example about the irritation on the skin. So we have to take uh, into account really everything of the medical uh, of the medical device, and a little bit of uh, of misuse. Of course, not too much. But for example, if we are dealing with a mouthwash, consider as mouthwash as a medical, a medical device, for example, ingestion can be, uh, should, be, should be considered during the biological evaluation of medical device. So having those things in mind, we are ready for, uh, for the, for the next, uh, for the next uh, step, that is uh, the, hazard, uh, the hazard identification. Of course, having in mind all these things will allow us to define acceptance criteria on, uh, on, our, on our evaluation related to the, um, related really to the intended use of a medical, uh, medical device. For the hazard identification, we have to define and characterize each material, including suitable uh, alternatives, we have to identify hazard in materials, additives, processing aids. This is really extremely important because the manufacturing process could dramatically change the properties, the behavior of, uh, of, the, of the material. We have also to identify the potential effect of downstream processing on chemical present in final device, in the final product, in the, in the, in the device under, under assessment. We have to identify the chemicals that could be released during the, the use of, um, of the product. We have to identify the hazards related to the packaging and storage. So the interaction between the device and, uh, and the packaging. And finally, we have to estimate the exposure, total exposure or a clinically available amount. And again, last but not least, uh, very uh, relevant uh, review all the uh, data uh, available on, uh, on the device, on, uh, on, uh, on the materials. I would like to stress a little bit about the impact of the manufacturing process. 
And here we have uh, an example with a very well known material. Let me say one of the most famous biocompatible material, poly polyethylene. And if you see here from a safety, safety data sheet, no hazard uh, are, um, are, uh, are associated with, uh, with this material. It's really a very well known material. If you perform a bibliographical uh, research about the biocompatibility of polyethylene, you will find tons of, uh, of data about the safety of this, uh, of this material. So really no hazard are related to the, to the PE. So in short, uh, no biocompatibility concern is related to the use of, the, of, the, of this material from bibliographical research. There is a clear evidence of uh, biocompatibility. So it seems uh, quite straightforward, but there is really a, an important question. We have always to think, are we sure about this in my medical device, in the device under assessment? And always ask this question, what about the manufacturing? What about the sterilization, the sterilization process of the finished uh, medical, uh, medical device? Because we are dealing with the biological evaluation of the finished medical device as it's used on, uh, on, uh, on the patient. After that, we are ready for the actual risk estimation. Some question, what we already know from, uh, from, from the device, we have to use all the information that, uh, that we have, data on early generation device, other similar use of the materials and add this to fill, up, to fill the gaps, the use of in-house testing, uh, testing data, the use of material manufacturing data, and of course, uh, literature. We should gather all the, uh, all the available data and ask a, a crucial question. Is existing knowledge enough to understand the biological risk applicable to, to the device use? So applicable to my specific device. We perform a biological evaluation specifically for a device, not a biological evaluation in, uh, in general. If, uh, if all the information are enough, we are fine. We can conclude about the safety of, uh, of the device. If not, we have to, uh, to carry out testing to fill the gaps in, uh, in the knowledge. And in case of test, we have to compare the, the result that we obtain with the acceptance criteria that we have defined in the, first, uh, in the first step. So we have to be prepared on how to deal with the result coming from coming from the test, not just wait the test and see what, uh, what happens in, uh, in the test. It's quite uh, simple. If we have the final criteria, we have the test result, it's, it's easy. Are acceptance criteria met? In case the acceptance criteria are met, the biological safety is established. So we have, let me say, to draft the biological evolution report, concluding about the safety of, uh, about the, safety of the device, otherwise, some risk control measures are required. So we have to go back uh, in our process, in process, in our device and change something. For example, change in, uh, in the design, such as, for example, um, do some reconfiguration of the packaging to reduce the level of, uh, of ethylene oxide, uh, for example, or change some materials, change some additives. And of course, in case uh, there is no room for, uh, for change, we should provide warning, provide of course that the overall safety is, um, is assured and the, the balance between risk and, and, and benefit is, is, is assessed. And uh, we have to, to inform uh, the, the user. Of course, of course, providing warning is not a measure of, uh, of, risk, uh, of risk control. But uh, maybe that in some cases we cannot do uh, something something different. So how we deal, how we process uh, uh, this in the in the biological evaluation, we follow this uh, uh, this uh, this flowchart. The picture of the device, what is the device, what is included, is uh, is clear from the previous step. So we are ready to assess uh, the uh, the the device using this uh, this flowchart always from ISO 10 one 
I don't want to go through um, the entire the entire flowchart because I'm sure that we are familiar with uh, with this uh, with this flowchart. But of course, if there is any question later on, I'm more than happy to to answer to to your question. But I would like to to stress uh, just one thing: that testing is is just here in the bottom uh, of this uh, of this chart. So this means clearly that testing is not the first uh, the first option, and the selection of the relevant endpoint um, for for the medical device uh, it's just before before the testing. Of course, sometimes uh, let me say practically practically speaking, we select the relevant endpoint in a preliminary phase in order to help us, to, to guide us in the selection of the relevant uh, data. So sometimes we do a shortcut from the start. We select the biological uh, endpoints. So having in mind this, and we see how to select the, the relevant endpoint in a while, we go through the, the rest of, of the, of the flowchart. As I told you um, at, the, at the beginning, the biological evaluation should be planned in advance. So a key document of, um, of the entire process is the biological evaluation plan. Biological evaluation plan drafted by a team, not by a single person. We need knowledge in different fields to have a complete assessment. So um, in this, the ISO 1083-1 is quite clear. The biocompatibility evaluation shall be planned, carried out, and documented by knowledgeable and experienced professionals. Therefore, we really need a team to be, to be involved. Let me say that it is a, a team game. Uh, it's not just for, for a free, just single freelance doing, doing everything. As just seen, the, the team should uh, categorize the medical, uh, the medical device. As we have seen in the previous slide, the selection of the, the relevant endpoint is based on the categorization, and the team is in charge of, uh, of, doing, uh, of doing this. The categorization of medical device help us in the selection of the appropriate data set, in the selection of the relevant endpoint to be addressed. Please pay attention that I'm referring to endpoints to be evaluated, not to tests to be, to be performed. Categorization is based on the nature of the body contact within the patient and, uh, and the device. And of course, it's based on the duration of, uh, of the contact. As you know, uh, some uh, medical device may fall into more than one body contact or uh, duration. So therefore, in a different, different categorization. In uh, this case, uh, the evaluation of the appropriate data set to each category should be carried out. This doesn't mean uh, to double the, the number of the test. This means just to think in a comprehensive way. So to take into account all the possibility related to the use of the medical, uh, of the medical device. Now we'll see something about the nature of the body contact and the duration of the body contact as it's defined in ISO 1083-1. Based on the nature of the contact, we have four main categories. The first one is, uh, let me say, a stupid one, non-contacting uh, uh, device. Device or component that have neither direct nor indirect contact with the body and where biocompatibility information would not be necessary. So in terms of biological evaluation, we don't need to perform further, further assessment because there is no contact at all um, with, the, with the patient. Uh, please remember that our focus is with the patient. So we are more interested in, in the, we are, let me say, quite only interested in this type of, uh, in this type of contact. The next category, uh, indeed as a, a body contact. It's a for surface contacting device. We have device in contact, we can have a device in contact with skin, so device in contact with intact skin. We can have device in contact with mucosal membrane, so where the contact is with, again, intact mucosal, mucosal membrane. And the third subcategory is for device in contact with breached or compromised surface. So every time, 
the, the surface, the skin is breached or compromised, we have to put our device in, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this category. The third category, again with an actual uh, body, body contact, is uh, the so-called externally communicating device. We have a device with uh, indirect contact with uh, the blood path. So device or components that do not necessarily uh, directly contact um, the, the, the blood path, but serves as a conduit to deliver fluid into the vascular system. For example, an infusion line is, is categorized in, um, in, this, in this category. Then we have some externally communicated device in contact with tissue, bone, dentin. So devices that are in uh, contact um, in contact with uh, this uh, with this system, or device or components that do not necessarily contact the tissue or bone, but again serve as a conduit to deliver fluids in the tissue or bone. So not in the blood path, but directly in in the tissue. For example, an irrigation uh, an irrigation set uh, is can be can be put in this uh, in this category. Then we have externally communicated device, but device that are in contact with circulating, uh, circulating blood. The last, uh, the last category, and of course, as you can imagine, the risk is higher as we increase the, the category, the skin, uh, the skin contact device. Uh, usually uh, those type of device have a low risk, while, the, and here we are in the, in the last category, implant device as usually an eye uh, an higher risk compared to the to the skin contact and so as you can imagine the data set required is is bigger compared to the skin contact device for uh, uh, implant device we have devices that are uh, implanted in tissue and uh, bone so principally contacting the bone or um, tissue or um, or fluid or devices that are in contact with blood, implanted device in contact with blood. So device in contact with circulating blood into the cardiovascular system. Then, a, let me say, a further uh, details were, um, were put in the ISO 1 of 2018, just to better clarify that most tissue uh, contains circulating blood. However, the category of implant device in contact with blood is not intended to encompass device implanted into tissue that contact, uh, that contain transitory release, uh, release the blood. So uh, for example, a surgical mesh is implanted in, uh, in tissue. For sure, there is a contact with blood, but this does not mean that the um, Surgical mesh is considered to be an implant device in contact with blood. A surgical mesh is an implant device in contact with, uh, with tissue. That's, um, that's quite an uh, important uh, clarification provided by the new edition of, uh, of ISO 1083-1. The ISO 1083-1 of 2018 introduced further clarification on some device in contact with intact uh, skin. So some device used in a, um, either in a sterile or a non-sterile environment uh, include components that, that can come into, into contact with users, users unglued and such as human interfaces for electronic equipment, keyboards, uh, buttons, uh, uh, touch screen, uh, SD card, USB sticks and, uh, and so on, or part or um, um, yeah, component uh, as housing for electronic monitors or programmers that come in contact with any intact skin. So for example, electronic device like uh, mobile, uh, mobile phone, tablet, so the device uh, of this, of this reg uh, nature or components that come in contact with users glow at the end. In this case, for example, you can imagine the endless of a catheter it's, uh, it's in contact just with the surgeon glued and so there is no direct contact between the skin of the surgeon. So we are not uh, dealing with a patient, but we are dealing with, let me say, with a user and uh, uh, with a glued and so there is for sure a, a barrier between the, the catheter and the, 
uh, and, and the skin, and there is no contact of this part with the patient. That is our, our focus. So for, uh, for all these, uh, these uh, kind of, uh, for all these kind of, uh, kind of uh, device, uh, components or part of this device that can be shown to be made from materials in common use for other consumer product with a similar nature of contact. So we, if we can prove if we can prove this, no further biological evolution is uh, is uh, needed. This uh, usually it's just justify in the biological evolution plan. You can say, okay, this is a material, uh, it's exactly the same material as a mobile phone. There is exactly the, the same type of, uh, the same type of, of contact. So there is no need to perform a further test. In this view, FDA issued a um, few months ago, a specific guideline on the skin contact material when uh, they say that there is for some very well-known material, they say that there is no. Uh, need to to perform uh, to perform a test, but of course this should be justified in uh, in the plan. In terms of duration of the contact, we have three um, three categories: limited exposure, the so-called category A, device uh, whose cumulative sum or single, or multiple or repeated exposure is up to twenty four hours, so a contact that is less than one day. Prolonged exposure from one day to one month, so from 24 hours to 30 days. Uh, it's a category B, prolonged exposure. And uh, uh, category C, now it's called long-term. Uh, in the past, was was um, was called permanent exposure. Now, uh, it's just a different of, uh, of name, but the, uh, the range of the duration is the same. It's from 30 days, so from one month to the entire uh, to the entire uh, life. So just those uh, those uh, three category: A less than one day, B less than one month, C more than one month. Quite, a, it's quite straightforward. Uh, but the there is a further clarification on the ISO 23-1 of 2018 for uh, category uh, category A. ISO 1003-1 introduced a, a clarification on the so-called transitory contacting device. So it's a subcategory of, um, of the category A. And uh, we usually consider a transitory contact, a contact that is less than one minute. For example, with the Lancet with the epidermic needles capillary tubes. Because of this very, very short uh, contact, those type of devices generally do not require testing to address the, the biocompatibility. Again, we justify this in, uh, in the plan. But there is a, a big but. However, as it said, for, uh, this, um, <clears throat> for this product made with materials, with a coating or with lubricants that could be left in contact with body tissue, after the medical device is, is removed is possible and usually it's it's the case that a more detailed biocompatibility assessment would be necessary so if the um, the lens for example has no lubricant we are we are fine but if we consider a lubricant and the lubricant can last for more than one minute maybe that we need further uh, for, for sure we need further assessment Again, this doesn't mean further test, but for sure further, uh, further assessment. Cumulative uh, use also should be should be considered. And if a material device can be placed in more than one category duration, the most rigorous um, evaluation program uh, should be should be applied and should be should be considered. Now. Having in mind the intended use, having in mind the, the, the medical device, having in mind uh, the, the manufacturing process, uh, the, the packaging. So every really in mind the full picture of the medical device, we are ready to select the relevant uh, endpoints for, uh, for the, the device. So with the, the categorization, we can use uh, the metrics proposed uh, in, a, in an annex, in a, it's called a table A 
of the ISO 10A3-1 for the relevant biological, biological end, uh, end point. As you see here, according and as you know for sure, according to the categorization, we have a different data set required um, by, by the ISO 10A3-1. And uh, the range of endpoints, uh, it's, um, it's really a big range from cytotoxicity, so efforts on, uh, on cell, up to chronic systemic efforts or even carcinogenicity or efforts uh, on, uh, on a reproductive, uh, reproductive tissue, if of course it's, uh, it's relevant for, uh, for a medical uh, device. As you see here, uh, there is something common uh, to all categories. It's uh, so-called uh, mandatory uh, information. The first column, the physical uh, and or chemical uh, chemical information. So the chemical characterization is is really uh, in common to to every to every device. And in the text of a standard, the request for the chemical characterization is really explicit. It's not only in uh, in the table, but it's that is an informative annex. But it's also in the text of um, of the. Um, of the of the standard and really it's really explicit to uh, to have this compared to the previous uh, version of ISO 1083 um, one other columns uh, were uh, were were added uh, for example uh, pyrogenicity uh, for example uh, the uh, long term uh, systemic tests were were split for example uh, reprotox and uh, and um, and degradation so new columns are are there but only one column is a prerequisite as a, as the standard said and again is a physical and chemical uh, chemical information so the chemical uh, characterization is really a prerequisite information needed for the risk assessment. The other endpoints uh, to be to be evaluated relevant for a medical uh, medical device. So the other endpoints evaluated in the biological evaluation can be assessed either through the use of existing data, additional endpoint specific tests, or a rationale for why the assessment of the endpoints does not require an additional data set. So in vitro uh, and uh, in vivo biological tests are performed only to fill the gaps in, uh, in our knowledge. In terms of tests, now moving to, to, to the test, chemical characterization tests are more and more relevant. But the chemical characterization is not only testing, it's uh, really something, something, something more. As I mentioned several, uh, several times, in, in the previous slide, the chemical characterization is a crucial first step of the biological evaluation of a medical device. I told you about the text of the ISO 1083-1. Let's see here. Description of the medical device chemical constituent and consideration of material characterization, including chemical characterization with reference to part, to part 18, shall precede any biological evaluation test. This is something from part uh, from part one. So what is required uh, by uh, ISO 1083-1 to be covered with the chemical characterization? At the minimum, the, uh, the chemical characterization shall address the constituent chemicals of the medical device and possible residual process aids or additives used in its manufacture. And when we look uh, um, for the definition of constituent chemical, we find two definitions. From part one, chemical constituent is any synthetic or natural substance that is used in a process for manufacturing materials and or medical device, including the base materials, additives, and the processing aids. So really it's a quite uh, um, comprehensive uh, definition. And in part 18, so in ISO 18 we have even some more details. A constituent is a chemical that is present in a finished medical device or in its material of construction. It may be intentionally present, such as additives, antioxidant, or unintentionally present, such as an impurities. So therefore, our aim during the, the, chemical, uh, the chemical characterization, that is, as we have seen, the first step of the biological evaluation, 
our aim during this, uh, this step is to assess both what is intentionally present in the device and all the impurities that can be present due to raw material, manufacturing process, packaging, and the interaction between packaging and medical device and, uh, and, um, and the sterilization. The, um, this is, let me say, a general approach to, uh, to the chemical, uh, chemical characterization as it's uh, described by ISO 10 18 of 2020. First of all, uh, the chemical characterization, as I said, it's not just testing, it's a process of collecting and eventually generating, of course, if it's needed, chemical, chemical data. I don't want to, again, to go through this, uh, this flowchart because we'll have a, a webinar or specifically on, uh, on the chemical, uh, chemical characterization. But uh, uh, I would like to, to point out that in this flowchart, a question is repeated three times. Does risk assessment conclude the device as an acceptable risk? So we are asking to perform a toxicological evaluation when we approach the chemical characterization. In other words, the toxicological risk assessment is an essential uh, stage of the chemical characterization of a medical, uh, medical device. So we, when we perform a chemical characterization, we don't just perform chemical, uh, chemical tests, we perform uh, the chemical characterization, or eventually we perform, uh, we perform a test having in mind the risk assessment of, uh, of the medical, uh, medical device. What does the standard mean with toxicological risk assessment? The toxicological risk assessment is the act of determining the potential of a chemical to elicit an adverse effect based on a specified level, exposure, level of exposure. So it's so important. It's repeated three times in the in the flow chart, but in the text you will find it repeated fifty five times. So <laughs> it's to, to stress about the importance of this uh, of this uh, step. And what is the link between the chemical testing and the, the toxicological assessment? The chemical characterization of a medical device provides the necessary input. Uh, into the device biological evaluation and toxicological risk, uh, risk assessment. So in this sense, uh, chemistry is at the serving of toxicology. We do chemistry for toxicology. So, and uh, with this approach, we can waive uh, later on some long-term tests. Uh, in, the, in the majority of the case, when we are dealing with uh, genotoxicity, when we are uh, dealing with uh, long, uh, long term uh, systemic, uh, systemic efforts, we perform a chemical characterization in the sense of an extractable study. We perform a toxicological risk assessment of the data coming from the extractable study. And if we are, let me say, quite lucky that we are able to conclude that there is no concern about the use of a medical device in terms of long-term tests, we point out that there is no need to perform such long-term tests or uh, genotoxicity. It's uh, quite hard to, to have this approach for the short-term efforts for, or for the local efforts such as irritation or sensitization, but this really works for the long-term uh, term efforts using the chemical characterization and toxicological risk assessment in lieu of chronic toxicity of the genotoxicity is really a common approach and is more and more used in the biological, uh, biological evaluation. So I mentioned several times toxicological risk assessment. How we perform a toxicological risk, uh, risk assessment? We perform a toxicological risk assessment according to ISO 1093-17. So we have arrived to this, uh, to this important, uh, uh, important standard. But I have to say that the, the current edition of the standard, it's really um, an old standard. And we do something, something more than what is included in ISO 1093-17 uh, of 2002, that is the current edition of the standard. Because the ISO 1093-17 is dramatically evolving 
uh, just for the title, we see this uh, huge change from establishment of a global limit for leachable substance to the committee committee draft uh, that is the, uh, the the document that is uh, uh, um, and in in preparation in uh, the ISOTC one for uh, technical committee. The new title is toxicological risk assessment again psychological risk assessment. So we have clear a link between the new the new part 17 when it will be published and the part 18. So toxicological risk assessment of medical device constituents. Really clear and well uh, well uh, defined. The committee draft was uh, was issued uh, last uh, last year in the 2020 at the end of last uh, last year. So we are more or less here in the in the blue box, but the way to to have a, a new standard published is uh, is really still uh, still long. We have to uh, to go into the uh, the green uh, sorry the the orange uh, the orange uh, box uh, there. But I have to say that even if uh, the standard really has given way, uh, we apply a quite uh, common uh, approach. So uh, the, the use, of, for example, of analogs, the use of read across, the use, the use of in silico, in silico method that it's uh, more or less it's the state of the art and this state of the art will be reflected in the new ISO 1083-17. But I think that we also have uh, another webinar specifically on, uh, on the on toxicological evaluation and the toxicological risk assessment associated to the chemical, uh, to the chemical uh, characterization. So to, um, to summarize, uh, then yeah, we have, uh, we have time for, uh, for question for question and answer. Uh, to summarize what we have uh, seen uh, seen today, it's uh, an overview of the biological uh, of the biological evaluation of the medical uh, device. And as we have uh, seen, the ISO 1003 uh, series is the most relevant series for the biocompatibility. Uh, the the plan so planning uh, these um, this biological evaluation is is really essential it's really uh, the first uh, the first step in the entire process even plan the chemical characterization so we plan in advance everything knowing the medical device knowing uh, the information that uh, that we, that we have from a supplier knowing the manufacturing process uh, take into account the residues of the manufacturing process take into account the interaction of the medical uh, device and, and the packaging and so on and so forth but the plan is really uh, important beside the plan the team as uh, as we have uh, as we have seen the plan all the entire biological uh, biological uh, evaluation uh, and the conclusion that we draft in biological evaluation report should be drafted by uh, by a team with competent people involved in uh, in this uh, in this team as i stressed the chemical characterization is a prerequisite and the toxicological risk assessment could be used to to waive some uh, some endpoints so it's really a powerful tool to be used uh, in conjunction with uh, with the chemical characterization to waive to to have a strong rationale for not having performed some uh, some test or let me say to have the relevant data to assess uh, a specific uh, biological uh, biological endpoint and Today we have not seen uh, nothing from uh, from FDA uh, as as I mentioned. It's just main, mainly for uh, for the for the ISO. And as I mentioned just at the beginning, uh, FDA issued a brand new guidance on the use of ISO 1. Uh, to be honest, the new guidance is uh, is more or less aligned uh, with the ISO 1 of 2018. But uh, there is uh, some peculiarities in uh, in the FDA approach, in the US FDA approach. So let me say, stay tuned for uh, the next uh, the next webinar on on this specific uh, specific topic. So 
Having said that, I just want to, to thank uh, Tunka and Advikwal for, uh, for these opportunities. My, my colleague in, uh, in Eurofan, uh, special uh, Claudia and, uh, and Ariana, who organized uh, this, uh, this webinar, but also the, uh, the colleagues in, uh, in my team, uh, when every day uh, we discuss with them, uh, we discuss every day about uh, the ISO 10 dash, um, dash one and the use of, uh, of this standard for specific uh, specific evaluation, because I forgot to mention it's uh, an horizontal standard that can be applied to every kind of medical device. But when uh, we arrive to a specific uh, device, we have maybe sometimes to adapt the um, the uh, the approach uh, on on our on our assessment. As already said by by Tunka, we have a time uh, for the question and answer, and I'm more than happy to answer to, to your question right right now. For any further uh, further question, you can drop me an email uh, at any time. You see here my my contact. So uh, let me say thanks uh, thanks Thank again. You, Paolo. Okay, uh, well, the first one will be the, the webinar recorded. Yes, sorry, the biological evaluation. Okay, uh, is the biological evaluation plan mandatory both for you, notify body, and for uh, uh, for FDA? Uh, well, there is a common strategy and approach for chemical uh, for chemical uh, for chemical characterization. Okay, well, okay. The the biological uh, the biological evolution plan. Uh, let me say, if we read the ISO 1083-1, is really a crucial uh, crucial document in the definition of the of the strategy, and it's uh, let me say a, a mandatory uh, document. As we have seen, more and more notified body in uh, in notified bodies in Europe so requires uh, require this um, this type of uh, this type of document even. Uh, for uh, medical devices that are already in the market. So let me say having a uh, time zero of the biological evaluation, drafting biological evaluation, sometimes the, there is a borderline situation between a plan and a report when we are dealing with a device already on the market, but having this, uh, this document, it's, uh, it's uh, really, really important. And the same is for for FDA to um, to provide them a, a clear picture of uh, of the strategy. Usually, the the plan for for FDA it's uh, is submitted uh, during the the presentation um, to to the FDA if it's uh, if it's uh, if it's required. And really, these help us uh, um, in uh, us and FDA to understand the, uh, the strategy of, uh, of the device. For sure, FDA, if it's not a plan, F FDA requires a, let me say, a comprehensive document, we can call it a biological evolution report uh, or a biological risk, uh, risk assessment, where all the, the data for, for the medical device are included, are assessed, taking into account again uh, the constituent, the chemical characterization, the manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing process, the, the data, and uh, the data from the um, uh, from the uh, from from the test in case they are uh, they are uh, they are performed. There is a common strategy and approach for the chemical characterization. Well, this is a quite, let me say, huge, uh, huge question. Um, yes, there are a common approach and strategy for uh, for the chemical characterization, for sure. When uh, we deal uh, with a medical device requiring an actual extractable or a leachable uh, or leachable test, the ISO 1083-18 uh, uh, provides uh, some guidance on uh, on the on how to approach an extractable test. So how to um, extract the device, the methods to be used to analyze the extract of the device, also the nature of those uh, of those extract, usually a polar and non-polar solvent that you're used to, to extract the device. And uh, well, the analytical techniques are required, and last but not least, the uh, analytical evolution threshold. So the, uh, the we say the chemical limits that uh, that we need uh, to uh, to apply in uh, in this. For sure, uh, ISO 1083-18, even if it's uh, really a 
huge change compared with the previous edition of, uh, of part 18 does not provide all the details on how to perform uh, to perform a chemical uh, a chemical characterization so again uh, it's up to the manufacturer in, in cooperation with, uh, with with the lab to plan uh, to plan a strategy take into account all the all the relevant uh, things but let me say that we are uh, not uh, uh working in in the dark but we have uh clear quite clear guidance and fda uh, in these uh, as um in, in also in the new uh, in the new guideline pointed out some additional additional requirements so let me say uh, we have information on how to design a chemical characterization both for the European market and also for the uh, for the US uh, US uh, market. Um, my question is about the version of the standard uh, by European Committee for uh, for the Condensation. The standard has been published in 2010 and named Biological Evaluation of Medical Device and ISO 10 one But according to the Council, okay, name EN ISO 10.3-1. Okay, <laughs> which year we should consider when we want to implement it? <laughs> okay, this is a um, this is a this is a good question related to the standardization process and the uh, the harmonization uh, the harmonization uh, process. The <clears throat> um, well, uh, there is a, um, Sometimes there is a gap between an ISO standard and the European uh, the European version of uh, the European version of the of the standard, because uh, uh, even uh, the the standard is developed under the so-called Vienna Agreement. So when or ISO or SAN as as the lead of uh, of this uh, of, of a standard, there is a gap between a European uh, the ISO version, the European version, or even the uh, national national version. So sometimes we have this uh, this type of uh, this type of gaps that is due to the time required to have uh, the the standard uh, into um, uh, into into this uh, into into that specific uh, let me say uh, regulatory regulatory body uh, san or san elect in uh, or san elect in in this uh, in this case the uh, the ISO 1093-1 uh, um, and by the way the um, the technical part of the of the of the ISO is uh, is still is uh, is maintained even there is a European uh, European version of the standard. What can be changed is the European forward and in case the standard is harmonized standard, the Annex Z when there is the link between the part of the standard and in case of um, uh, MDD the essential requirements and in case of NDR when we have uh, harmonized standard uh, we there is the link between uh, the part of the standard and the general safety and performance requirement having said that uh, the uh, ISO 1093-1 uh, uh, was published as we have seen in uh, 2018 and the actual uh, and the, the unique uh, e and so European version of ISO 1093-1 of 2018 was published in I in 2020. So you are you are right. So the uh, if you go into website you will find and it was actually published the last year the N ISO 1093-1 of 2020 referring to ISO 1093-1 of 2018. If you see the um, the, um, the European Co Council decision about the harmonized standard, so the publication of uh, of the standard, you will see that it's cited as N ISO 1093-1 of 2018, but this is wrong because uh, there is no EN ISO 1093-1 of 2018. So in short, there is just an ISO 1083-1 of 2018 and an ISO 1083-1 of 2020. So, but in terms of, uh, uh, let me say, approach, in terms of technicalities, in terms of 
core part of the standard is exactly the ISO version. So there is no change in uh, um, in the EN version of uh, in the EN version of uh, of uh, of the standard. Okay. Uh, it's possible to send us uh, this uh, presentation. I think uh, so with a, with a PDF. Um, I already have seen proceed with submission without a plan. Uh, data and biocompatibility, I think plan would make uh, everything easier, especially when, uh, especially for the manufacturer. I totally, sorry, I cannot. God. Uh, I totally, I totally agree, and uh, of course uh, the chemical characterization um, would depend on, uh, on 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 device. We don't approach the chemical characterization in uh, in the same way uh, for uh, uh, for different uh, different device, device. What about the gradation as biological endpoint to be to be evaluated? Okay, this is. Uh, this is a good uh, good point. Uh, it's um, it's referring to the to the table of the ISO 10.8-1, so the table A. And uh, if you see the table, um, there is something. Let me say a little bit strange. Uh, you see two columns: uh, degradation and uh, repro um, reproductive toxicity, that uh, um, are there, but there is no E or X. There is no. Um, <laughs> let me say no science there. This is uh, due to the fact that uh, those two endpoints should be always uh, considered in case the device is, in case of uh, reprotoxicity, intended to be in contact with reproductive tissue or um, in, uh, in contact with, um, with the fetus. So uh, the reprotox should be considered only when we have this kind of device. Doesn't matter the categorization, but uh, even, even we have a device, in short, uh, for example, uh, in contact with the mucosal, uh, mucosal membrane for a short uh, time period, but it's in contact with the reproductive tissue. So in that case, reproductive should be uh, should be should be considered. And the same is for uh, for degradation. We have always to take into account degradation uh, when we design a mm, or we have. Uh, or we deal with a degradable material. So in that sense, uh, even if, uh, for example, uh, we are uh, designing a device intended to be degraded, dissolved uh, in the body, in, even in a short uh, time, uh, time frame, we have to, uh, to take into account this, this endpoint. So are, uh, are there to remind us uh, to remind us uh, about the uh, those two endpoints that should be uh, that that should be that should be considered. So okay, there is also uh, thanks for uh, for for the comment uh, with uh, also the correction in table A A one of ISO of two thousand and um, uh, of two thousand and eighteen uh, because uh, the um, the ISO one of two thousand eighteen was. Um, firstly published in August, if I remember right, and then in November uh, a, a correction was made in the table A just for a, for a typo as, uh, as it's written in this comment, so thanks. Uh, the sensitization was missing, the, the word I mean sensitization was missing in, uh, in, uh, in the table and uh, the, um, the corrected version were was uh, was published in in, uh, in November uh, of 2018. Uh, our medical device is placed in, in uh, retina as a tampon between one to three months and then removed. It's not the great. Uh, still, should all implant tests be uh, be done? Well, um, that's. Um, Generally speaking, the efforts, um, the efforts uh, after after implantation should be should be evaluated. This uh, device uh, is going to be categorized uh, in terms of uh, duration as uh, as a C, so it's uh, more than uh, more than thirty days, even if it's uh, it's uh, it's removed. Um, if we 
look just to the um, implementation site as defined by ISO 1083-6, you will not find uh, the DI the as the implementation site described in, uh, in the test, because as you know, there is just um, uh, subcutaneous tissue, muscular implantation, bone implantation, and uh, the, the new uh, brain, uh, brain implantation. But within uh, the standard, there is uh, um, um, there is provision uh, related to the fact that other implantation sites can be used, uh, provided that uh, they are relevant for for the medical uh, for the medical device to be uh, to be assessed. As far as I remember, there is uh, some uh, vertical standard, so uh, standard dealing with a specific medical uh, device for uh, uh, for sure for intraocular lenses. Your device is not uh, an intraocular lenses, but uh, the animal uh, model uh, for the intraocular lenses is, is the rabbit. So we have, let me say, some, and uh, we have um, uh, we have at least a, a study design that we can use for uh, for this type of, of of test. But let me say that it's also a matter of. Uh, uh, assessing uh, the, the data that you already have. I don't know, of course, about your device. It's uh, just a few, um, few, few sentences here. And uh, of course, I don't know the, the history what is behind your, your device. But maybe it's the case that you will have uh, data coming from the actual clinical use of, uh, of the device. And for sure, the, uh, the assessment of the effects uh, of, uh, of the device in, uh, during, during the clinical use, it's, it's done. So it's not, let me say, an endpoint not evaluated in the clinical follow-up or even in the clinical, in the clinical study. So maybe, of course, I cannot, uh, uh, I cannot guarantee this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this approach, just having uh, this, um, just this, uh, this sentence, maybe that uh, we uh, we can uh, uh, leverage the need or waive uh, the, the need of an actual implantation uh, implantation uh, implantation test. But of course, uh, uh, we we need to dig uh, uh, in the detail um, uh, on the on the information that uh, that are available. What uh, what what we have uh, with uh, with the device. But um, generally speaking. Should the implantation test to be done? Uh, let me answer. Implantation uh, test should be uh, should be should be considered. Are supplier tests valid for biological data for a class one non sterile uh, manufacturing? Uh, well, um, generally speaking, those uh, those type of uh, those type of data are uh, are relevant. Uh, and uh, maybe that uh, they are applicable as uh, as they are. Uh, for sure, uh, there is a need to assess this type of data. So, for example, if you are just putting in your, your technical file the data coming from the supplier without any justification, without putting this uh, uh, this data in the right perspective, maybe. Uh, those uh, those tests uh, are not going to be uh, so relevant, even if uh, there is no notified body because it's a class A non-sterile non uh, non device. But maybe that you miss a part of um, of, of the process. If you uh, knowing the device, uh, all the uh, all the manufacturing manufacturing step, what uh, is uh, um, uh, what is included in the device, and you and with, and you have also this data coming from the supplier. Maybe uh, further uh, further test. Just a matter of assessing the data. I use the data from a supplier. I will do just, uh, for example, a, a cleaning. Uh, it's a, it's a theoretical example of a, of the, of the product with uh, with water uh, without any uh, any detergents without any any other chemicals then i i just put the device is a solid device and i put the device into a, a solid a solid container where there is no interaction between or minimal uh, interaction uh, 
very low, let me say, interaction between the packaging and, and the device. So maybe that there is no need to, um, to redo any, 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 further, any further assessment. I, or for example, I will, uh, the supplier provides me the, the device. I just uh, changing, for example, the packaging. And again, maybe that it's, uh, there is no need to, uh, to redo any further, for sure, any further test. But in any case, data coming from the supplier are, are relevant. On, on the other hand, you can imagine if you, if you have, a, for example, a, a raw material, a plastic raw material, uh, and your supplier provides you good, uh, good data, provides you, for example, cytotoxicity, cytotoxicity test, uh, the cytotoxicity test is negative, so this means that there is the device, the, device the, the material is not cytotoxic, and uh, you do something, you on uh, on this uh, plastic uh, plastic part maybe that uh, you are uh, manufacturing in some way this plastic part uh, uh, with the cnc or some wh whatever you want and later on you test the site to exist you uh, and uh, your device it's uh, turned positive so it's uh, cytotoxic you can easily argue that uh, uh, the the manufacturing step was affecting the the properties of um, the properties of the device. So maybe it's the manufacturing step. Maybe it's uh, the the cleaning uh, the cleaning part. Maybe that is not so effective. Maybe are the residues in uh, in uh, in the device. So all the information uh, coming from uh, coming from the supplier, coming from uh, maybe from your internal uh, internal test are relevant uh, and let me say are valid in assessing the uh, the finished medical uh, medical device. No, um, sorry, I'm I'm just checking the <laughs> the, the internal chat to see if there is a further further question from there not uh, not written uh, here in in uh, in the chat but as um, as i said uh, um, if you have a further further question you can just send it, uh, an email to me or to advical they will forward uh, the the email uh, the email to to me 